We are back. Sam Cedar, Emma Vigland on the Majority Report. Want to welcome to the program David Masiotra. He is a lecturer, a journalist uh, based in Indiana, author of Exerbia Now, the Battleground of American Democracy. Uh, David, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Um, and I just been told that the uh, guest book is a uh, book is not the link is not working. So we just got to fix that link. We, of course, uh, linking your your book. Um, but let's start with just define for us. I mean, it's interesting uh, timing for your book to come out because there's a lot of talk right now about rural uh, voters. Mm. And um, there's a couple of books out there and there's, you know, there's I've seen some like back and forth in terms of like um how do you uh, characterize these people? Is it rage or is it just resentment? Um, but you're talking about the exurbs, which seems to me to be uh, maybe more on point. Um, we, first off, define for us the exurbs, both like from a positive standpoint, but also in relation to rural and suburban. Of course. Uh, yeah, it was a big worry when I wrote the book that the mainstream media would start to get the story of Trump supporters and what's driving them right. And then I'd have nothing to talk about. But of course, that's not happening. So I have plenty of opportunities such as this one to define exurbia. Congratulations uh, to you. Um, uh, too bad for the rest of us, I guess, on some <laughs> level. But uh... um, Which exurbia differs from suburbia in uh, density and distance. So taking those in reverse order, an exurb is a town of greater distance from the nearest metro area, but with fewer people, so less population density. And this is very important because Trump's support is off the charts in exurbia. Uh, and also the most psychotic members of Congress. So lovable characters like Marjorie Taylor Greene and Matt Gates and Jim Jordan represent districts that are predominantly exurban. And that's quite different from the picture of rednecks and rubes, the little red hat boys that the media likes to discuss obsessively, uh, because the Wall Street Journal reports that median household income in exurbia is actually 15 to 20 percent higher than median household income across the United States. So it's it's a resentful uh, later stage of white flight that's driving people out of cities and out of increasingly diverse and sometimes even progressive suburbs into the exurbs. And they're creating these enclaves of uh, MAGA, mega churches. Uh, there's typically no local media, so they're getting this right, well, digital let's, before poison. We get in, I want to get into some more, uh, just uh, some more demographic stuff before we, we get to, to sort of like the like so um the this is area that is on the outskirts of cities i guess in the metropolitan area that was formerly rural areas um when was the development of these areas like uh, uh, temporally i mean if if the suburb if suburbia like really exploded in the 50s i guess and we had uh, in the 60s um, we had this sort of white flight, no, sort of, we had this white flight from the cities to, to sort of build up uh, suburbia. Um, w when, when was exurbias uh, or exurban areas um, uh, built up? So from the, the mid to late 90s to the present, it's still an area in growth and development, but it really started to take off uh, in the mid to late 90s. And what was it that drove people there? Were they coming from, were those folks coming from the rural areas and moving closer to the city? Or was it uh, people uh, leaving the city or leaving suburbia? No, they were planned community, communities for people live, leaving the city and leaving suburbia. Mm. Uh, and so real estate development firms built these areas up and they could do so and offer lower property taxes often. Uh, because you have new infrastructure, you have less of a need for police, firefighters, school teachers, librarians. So uh, it was white flight drove people out of the suburbs and out of the cities and a desire for isolation drove people to those areas. But then uh, some, some, some financially advantageous circumstances acted as a magnet strengthening that attraction. Um and give us a sense. I mean, you said that they're 10 to 15 percent um, wealthier than the the in the average 
uh, across the country. Where are they relative to suburbia and to, because I would presume suburbia is going to be the wealthiest, right? Except for some urban areas. Although from an average standpoint, I don't know how that works out, right? Because you have uh, probably pockets of extreme poverty uh, in these cities and, and, and uh, you know, uh, swaths of, 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 of real wealth. Where are they relative to suburbia and to rural? Well, that's an, they're definitely wealthier than rural areas. And many of these areas used to be rural. So they used to be where the, the trailer parks were located uh, and, you know, desolate outposts. But then these planned, these real estate development firms build up these areas, they become planned communities, and they begin to resemble suburbia, uh, particularly middle class and upper middle class suburbia. The suburban landscape has become more varied. So if you take where I live in Northwest Indiana, and I grew up in the South Chicago suburbs, uh, many of the towns of my youth that were middle class uh, have now descended into poverty uh, or at least uh, gone down a couple of ranks, economically speaking, uh, whereas other towns have grown and typically the towns that have grown are those uh, in exurbia or closer to exurbia. Yeah, I can picture honestly the town, the these developments that you're talking about. You know, I had family living in a kind of town like that in Pennsylvania, right, where it used to be middle class began to decline, but there's all these developments and kind of cul-de-sac areas where all the houses are newly constructed, and it fits the mold that you say, where it's upper uh, or it's middle class people moving in. And then eventually, I would say there's this there are some upper middle class people who are small business owners, which I'm curious about if that was a part of your analysis. There was in the wake of January 6th, there were a lot of people saying, well, these are just the working class people. It's the cry of the working class attacking the Capitol. And then weeks in the weeks following, there was some analysis done where it goes, a lot of these folks flew in and a lot of these folks own a pool cleaning business in uh, Missouri or they uh, have uh, some sort of, you know, small financial business in uh, Indiana. And I think that that fits quite neatly with your analysis of some of these Trump voters. Yeah, that's a crucial point. Uh David Brooks and his brethren gave us this asinine definition of the working class that it's just someone without a college degree. So if, if you're going to think and act according to those terms, an elementary school teacher making 30 grand a year is not working class, but a small business owner or a tradesman making 80 to 90 grand a year is working class. That makes no sense but it tends to be that latter category. So as you're saying, I'm a small business owners, but also people who do relatively well in the trades who populate these exurban towns and consistently support Trump and consistently support people like Jim Jordan and Matt Gates. And some of the research into January 6th is really fascinating. So for example, the number one common characteristic of people who stormed the Capitol uh, is residency in an exurban county uh, where the non-white population is growing and also where the black-white poverty gap is shrinking. Uh, and people who've looked at these, uh, you know, these, these wannabe aspiring fascists uh, have concluded that it's primarily culture and identity and resentment and hatred surrounding those issues, not economics, because they're not working class by any sensible definition of the term. So um, w where are these people working? Like if you're out in that sort of like, uh, you know, netherworld, like, who, like where are they? You know, if I was to look at a, a typical, you know, five or three typical ex-urban uh, folks, like are they... Are they working remotely? Are they going in? Are they work for insurance company? Like, who is it that they they work? What kind of jobs do these people have? How often are they going into the city, or do they just work in suburbia, or are there are there are they working in exurbia? So they tend to work in suburbia. So you'll have people living maybe say sixty miles, seventy miles out of Chicago, 
working in suburban towns that are 15 or 20 miles out of Chicago. I, and as I was saying, they tend to be in the trades. Many of them own their own construction firms or uh, own their own electrician company, uh, a plumbing company. So there, there are people of that nature, you know, petty bourgeoisie, uh, who are going into the suburbs where they previously escaped. Usually they used to live in these suburbs. That's where they built their business. That's where they began to earn their living. Then they fled to Exerbia, but most of their customer base and clientele still is in suburbia. 